Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's good to be in the Lord's house today. You know, as we deal with life every day, the challenges, the difficulties, the heartaches, the setbacks, uh, there's joys along the way. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But this is just such a wonderful place to be after living in the world for the week that we can come and we can be refreshed by the Spirit of God. We can be renewed and equipped to, to go out into the world to make a difference for the kingdom of God. And so I'm glad that you're here. It's good to be with you today as we worship the Lord. Uh, our bulletin <clears throat> was bigger than my Sunday paper this week, I think. So let's see where to start. <clears throat> Today is a Worldwide Communion Sunday. We're going to join with the saints throughout the world. We're going to celebrate the bread and the cup together. Uh, for those of you that are at home, uh, if you'd like to get a piece of bread and, and a cup of juice or a cup of water or a cracker, uh, we'd love you to worship with us as we celebrate the Lord's table. All that we ask is that you have received the grace of Jesus, that you are a child of God through his grace, through his sacrifice on the cross at Calvary. Um, Wednesday night from 6.30 to 7.30, we have Kids Club. They had a, a great uh, meeting on Wednesday. I, I think she, uh, Joan and company had about six or seven children, uh, and uh, it's always a good thing. On Thursday evenings at 7 p.m., we've started our Bible study. We are in Exodus 1 this week. Uh, that is by Zoom. If you have a computer and you'd like to join that, let me know. I'd be more than happy to email you a link. Uh, the altar flowers are presented to the glory of God in honor of our mom and dad, uh, Becky and Jim Phillippe's 34th wedding anniversary today by Ben, Holly, and Aaron. Well, happy anniversary. Very good. God is good. Marriage is a wonderful gift from God. And uh, for men, when you can uh, learn this, yes, dear, get that down, uh, you can avoid a lot of problems in marriage, uh, let me tell you. I, I know from experience. We can uh, compare notes after the service if you like. Uh, the bulletins presented the glory of God in honor of Pastor Bob and Phyllis Shuey during Pastor Appreciation Month by Mark Paul. Thank you, Mark. We greatly appreciate it. We feel very loved by the congregation here and are very grateful to uh, share in the Lord's work with you and to have your, your friendship and love and grace. Uh, we are going to take a, uh, a special offering today. If you're able to, there is a, a plate uh, that is designated as the hurricane relief offering. Uh, just the devastation across six states, uh, people that lost everything. There are private uh, individuals coming together. Uh, Mark Paul shared how Samaritan's Purse has been involved with that. And if you're able to give something towards that, it, it, it can go a long way in helping to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Uh, which reminders, uh, Samaritan's Purse, uh, I know uh, it's early yet, but we are going to be unfolding Operation Christmas Child in a few weeks and give everyone about a month to return the boxes so that we can get those back to the distribution center on time and that those across the world can not only receive tangible gifts, but also to have time of prayer and to have shared with them the love of Jesus. And so that will be coming in other weeks, we'll, we'll keep you posted. Uh, ushers today are Glenn and David Worley. Our greeters were Lynn and David Campbell. Uh, outside of the sanctuary here is a free round table and chairs. If you would like to have a round table and chairs, you can take it with you. Uh, or if you know somebody that would like to have it, by all means, let them know. We would be uh, happy to, uh, to give that to someone that has need. Uh, there's listing for pantry needs. Uh, the Why Missing Band is uh, participating in Boscov's Friends and Family event on October 22nd. Uh, for $5, uh, you'll receive a shopping pass for up to 25% off of all purchases. If you're interested, you can see Becky Philippi. Uh, Apple Dumpling Sale. There is a sign-up sheet in the vestibule as you come in the front door. Uh, they're $4 a piece. <clears throat> the uh, orders are due by today. And, and so uh, Apple Dumplings will be here for pickup next week. And so today's the last day to order. Uh, you can sign up on the sheet there. Uh, you can give Rob and Lash uh, the, the uh, money for each one. It's $4 a piece. <clears throat> this uh, tomorrow, <clears throat> which reminds me I need to call my neighbor. Excuse me. Tomorrow they will be... Um, repairing the parking lot on Grape Street into the driveway between the church and the parsonage. They are going to dig that up, 
And so there, we will not be able to park on that until next Sunday. So that means probably not a whole lot for most of you, uh, but for food pantry and people like that, uh, just to let you know that that is going to be closed off until uh, this coming Sunday. Uh, Kingdom extension offering during October to be used for special offerings. Uh, Rally day is going to be on October 20th. Uh, there's an insert in your bulletin uh, about the rally day. Brothers and Grace will be here. There's only going to be one service that day at 9 a.m. There won't be any Sunday school that week. So uh, if you want to be a part of the rally day to hear Brothers and Grace, come on out at 9 o'clock on the 20th. Our goal is to raise $6,000. Uh, 1000 for missions, 1000 for student aid, and the balance just goes for the upkeep of the church and uh, the, the needs that we have. Uh, birthday, Miriam Kern is at United Zion Retirement Community in Lidditz, and she will be 93 on the 9th. Uh, for those of you who'd like to mail a card out to her, uh, I remember uh, Miriam when I first got here. She always was in the back pew there, and uh, she's a sweet lady, a very, very nice lady. Uh, friends and flowers in the garden of life. Friends are the flowers in the garden of life. How true that is. In your bulletin, there is a prayer sheet for one cry for the month of October. I know today's the 6th, but it's working through Nehemiah and, uh, you know, a posture of humility, a posture of prayer. Uh, you can look at each of the day and just kind of incorporate that into your daily prayers. The uh, CPYU parent page is in the bulletin. Uh, it's, it's a great source for <clears throat> parents and grandparents to, uh, you know, just keep uh, Keep informed of all that our children and youth are dealing with today. Uh, there's a, a great quote in there uh, from Drew Barrymore that, that wished at times that somebody would say no to her when she was growing up. And uh, oftentimes when we're told no, what is it we want to do? Exactly what we're being told not to do. But she uh, wishes at some point in her life that she would have had a little more direction. So that's a great source to have. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Doug Sewell. Good morning. We have a preparation for worship uh, uh, prayer, so uh, please pray with me. Almighty and loving God, we thank and bless you for the encouragement you have given us through teachers and mentors and witnesses of your love. We pray that as we lead worship today, you will use our words and actions to encourage others. May this worship service truly enable us to sense our communion with all the people of God in every time and place. To the glory and praise of you alone, through Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. The Spirit is coming to bless us with a new song. Let our joy be complete. Gifts for the good of all, poured out on all, who teach, on all to teach us a new song. Love one another. Strangers and neighbors, foreigners and family will join in the new song. No longer servants, but friends. Come, let us worship and make a joyful noise, rejoicing in the friendship of God. Let us pray. Oh, Father, it's so good to gather today, to come together as a community of faith, to be fed by your word, to sing the hymns, to celebrate all that is ours in Christ Jesus. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us this day. Renew us body, mind, and spirit, equipping us to do your will in the world. We oftentimes face so many challenges throughout the week. It's good to gather. It's good to fellowship. It's good to know that uh, we together need you, and we also need one another. And so, Father, we pray your rich blessing that you would continue to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Surround us in your care as we worship this day. For these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Our opening hymn today is uh, hymn number 347, And Can It Be? 347. Should 
which die for me. Amazing, Amazing love, how can, how can it be that thou, that thou my God, should die for me? He left his Father's throne. So infinite his grace emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all immense and die for me, no my imprisoned spirit that's bound in sin and nature's night, thy night diffused a quickening ray, I will dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be? Thou, my God, should die for me. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amen. You may be seated. What a a wonderful hymn, the hope that is ours in Christ Jesus. We are so blessed that the grace of God through the shed blood of his son has set us free from sin and death. He has given us uh, the pathway of hope that as his children that we are being formed and shaped and molded into people that God created us to be and one day we will be finished perfectly in Christ Jesus. We are uh, grateful for everyone that gives time, talent, and treasure for the work of God to be accomplished throughout the world. You know, as I think about the, the local church and its impacts, uh, impact in the world, it's just amazing. You know, we here in Moton, Pennsylvania are touching all parts of the world uh, through various ways. Uh, one of the, the most powerful things we can do is to continue to pray. Pray for God to to bring healing and hope into the world, to bring provision, uh, to bring transformation in the lives of those that uh, profess Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Uh, We are truly on a mission from God. I have a a t-shirt at home that says, I'm on a mission from God. Uh, It's actually uh, from a movie, but uh, in a sense, we really are on a mission from God. 
uh, as we seek to make disciples, as we seek to bring people to a place of confession and a realization of their desperate need for a Savior. And we worship that Savior today, and we're gathered together, and we know that He is with us in our midst. Let us pray. Father, we pray your blessing uh, for our tithes, our offerings, and for the special offering today for those that have been impacted by this hurricane. We pray, Father, that you would use them and multiply them for your glory and for your grace. We pray that you would bless the gift and the giver as we continue to lift up the name of Jesus to a lost and hurting world, for he is our Savior. He has set us free from sin and death. It is our desire to see others come to that place of knowledge of their desperate need of a Savior. It's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our um, pastoral prayer, there is so much to, to pray for. We're praying for all that is happening in Israel. We're praying for the peace of Jerusalem. We're praying for those that are impacted in the world through natural disasters, through sin that is so pervasive, with uh, senseless killings every day in our cities and communities. You know, I really believe that uh, Satan is having a field day. You know, he knows his time is limited. We see the impact of it in our, our culture today. We pray for the United States as we enter into this election. Uh, one of the things that I, has really broken my heart over the last several years is to see people that are against one another now because we think differently. There's something wrong with that, that I can't have a different opinion from somebody else without being looked down upon or hated, and vice versa. It, it's not to one side or the other. I, I really pray that God will bring healing into the United States, that uh, our elected leaders, whoever they may be, that they would look to God for direction, for wisdom, guidance, as they seek to bring harmony and unity in this country. I think it's important that we continue to pray for all of these things. We have people on our prayer list that we pray for ongoing issues. We pray for those that are mourning loved ones. And I, I don't know what it would be like to lose everything I belong, that I have materially, but not know where someone in my family is. And people are dealing with that. And nothing is absent from God. We were talking about it in Sunday school. You know, ultimately, we live in a world that's laden with sin. And at the fall, not only did sin come into mankind, but it impacted the world that we live in. God created a good world, and God's plan, ultimately, of redemption is perfected in Christ Jesus and will be fulfilled in Christ as it was at Calvary. We will see that fully realized one day when Christ returns. But there's so much that we can continue to pray about. And we should be on our faces every day praying. One of the things that I'm trying to incorporate into my own prayer life is a time of silence. Still working on getting comfortable with silence. But also a time of praise. To thank God for who he is and what he's done in our lives. And then to lay before him my burdens. He already knows. But it's just something special knowing that we can come to the God of the universe and we can pray. And he hears, he understands, and he provides in his way and in his time.
Let us pray. Father God, we truly are grateful for all that you have done for us in the giving of your Son that has gained us the rights and privileges of eternity with you in heaven one day as your children dearly love. We pray, Father, for those on our prayer list, those that are on our hearts and minds. We pray for the devastation in the, the six states or so that have been impacted by the hurricane and just all that's going on in our world today. We think of Israel and all that may be happening with Iran, and we just pray, Father, that you would go before us, that you would provide protection and healing and provision. We pray, Father, for those in hospital and nursing care and for our shut-ins, for those that are not able to be here today. We pray for those that mourn loved ones, that they might find comfort in your presence, that they might find the assurance of your love and grace in Christ Jesus, that they would know that you're with us truly through all phases of life and even into glory one day. And so, Father, continue to do that work in us that began the day that we received Jesus as Lord and Savior. We pray, Father, for our missionaries and the missions that we support throughout the world. And we do pray for our country. We pray for the upcoming election. We pray for our leaders nationally and locally that you would impact their lives, that they would seek you for wisdom and grace. I think about Abraham Lincoln who kept a copy of your word on his desk. May that be so, Father, with our leaders that they would seek you and serve you, that they would seek to do what is right for all people here in this country. And so, Father, we ask for your blessing today. We ask that you would not only forgive us for sin, but that you would heal us, that you would give us a, a greater desire to seek you, to serve you, to love you, and to proclaim you, that we might be faithful and emulating Jesus as Lord and Savior of our lives, and Jesus who taught the disciples to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Next hymn is, uh, praise hymn is one of my favorite hymns, Just As I Am, coming to God with open hands and transparent lives and humbly seeking his face and his presence. And you know, that's the great thing that we don't have to get perfect to come to a perfect God. Imperfectly, he receives us, he loves us, and he restores us to a rightful place in Christ Jesus. Let us praise God in song.
Just as I am, Thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because Thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I Coming to God in honesty and humility and, and realize he, he knows us better than we know ourselves. But just laying bare before a holy God who, who we are and who we desire to be in Christ. I, I just think there's something so powerful about that. You know, there's so many things that people can hide behind masks and shield the outside world from. But God knows us perfectly and wonderfully, and in spite of us, He sent His Son to redeem us, to allow us to have everything that is ours in Christ. You know, I was sharing with the 8 o'clock service this morning that I, I wish that you could put it in a bottle or a pill and give it to our friends and neighbors and those that are outside of the will of God and that they could know just how wonderful God is. We don't have to do that. See, God's Spirit is there. You know, we're talking about it in Sunday school. People say, well, I found God. Well, guess what? He was looking for you all along. You finally yielded to His Spirit. You know, I, I know there are a lot of people that know God. But not everybody obeys God. The title of the message is Know Your Enemy. The Apostle Paul in the first two sections of chapter 7 of Romans, it almost sounds like he's saying that uh, the law of God is the reason we sin. That's not what he's saying. We'll look at that as we go through this uh, passage of Scripture today. You know, God's with us. God's working in us that which is pleasing. But we have to be willing. And I wish you could get it by osmosis where it just happened. And, and grace is, is free. It's a wonderful gift of God. It was a costly gift from God. But growing in knowledge, faith, and love, this act of sanctification, this ongoing work of God, it, it takes time. It takes effort. It takes a willingness to desire God above everything else. That can only happen with an intentionality. So we need to know who the real enemy is. We need to know all that we have in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I pray your blessing upon my meager words today. And through your word that you would touch the hearts and minds and lives of those that are gathered here today, those that are watching through the stream. That we would realize, Father, that you have given us so much through your son, Jesus. We pray your blessing today that you would uh, just continue to work in us that which is pleasing, that you could free us from all that hinders the sin that so easily entangles us, that we could run with perseverance the race that's marked out before us as we continue to fix our eyes on Jesus. Our only hope today has always been our, our only hope. We oftentimes are so consumed in ourselves and the ability to do things on our own that we minimize all that is ours in Christ. And so, Father, bless us this day as we read your word, as we listen to the message, as we leave from this building today, knowing that you're working in us that which is pleasing in your sight. For this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You know, something truly amazing to be set free to live the life that is ours in Christ Jesus. It's, it's, it's really uh, invigorating and liberating to know that we're a child of God. We, we truly have the ability to say no to sin. And, and when we do sin, we choose to sin. But to understand that we're no longer bound by sin. We're no longer under the law that just really shows us how sinful we really are. See, see, we're now 
covered in grace through faith. We believe that God has done for us what we can't do for ourselves. And so we're free to seek and serve our Lord and Savior to bring honor and glory to a holy God that loves us. You know, it's my prayer and my desire for myself and for each of us that God could have more of us. You know, we're so easily distracted, at least I am. I, I really do think I have spiritual ADD. I, you know, at times I'm wanting to do something and find myself being scattered in so many different directions. And, and yet I, I know that when I can have a, an intent time, intentional time with, with God, pray and to listen, to read his word and have him speak to me through his word, that I, I, I want to have more of that. So I know my sin. I know the impact of my sin on my life. I know the impact of sin in your lives. I know the sorrow that we carry from past sin, but I also know the freedom that we now have in Christ, if we could just fully embrace that. But it does take work. It does take an intentionality. It takes a desire to love God above everything else. But I think when we can get to that place, we can not only be better people, but we're better equipped to share the good news of Christ Jesus in a lost and hurting world. Amen. Let's look at this from uh, Romans 7, verses 1 through 13. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. You can read from whatever translation speaks best to you. You can use uh, your smart devices to read it if you want. We did put a, a copy of the, the, the reading in your bulletin. But the Apostle Paul is saying that we're no longer bound to the law. He says, now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law... Don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the law of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. This could be said for the man as well. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ, and now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God, good fruit for God. When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us, and the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law. For we died to it. We are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would have never known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time, I lived without understanding the law, but when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life, and I died. So I, I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did the law, which is good, cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death so we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. You know, before coming to Christ as Savior and Lord, we may not have even been aware of the sin that plagued our lives so much. 
You know, the Apostle Paul understands the, the nature of the law. The moral standard of God is good and holy and perfect and pleasing, but it points out just how sinful we really are. And I was thinking about this. You know, Paul uses uh, not to covet as the thing, and he, he realized in the law that he wanted to covet. Is there something within us, in our DNA, in our sin nature, that wants us to do that which is contrary to a holy God? Let me give you an example. You can't have a cookie before dinner. I'm touching the cookie jar. And if mom's not looking, I'm going to eat that cookie. Don't touch the stove. It's hot. How many of you had your hands burned on a hot stove? Yes, we've been there. There's something contrary to our nature that wants to do the opposite of what is good and right and holy and pleasing. The law is not bad. The law is good. It's the perfect moral standard of God, but it, boy, it shows us the error of our ways. And so often we want to do the very things we're being told not to do. You know, sin's pleasurable for a season. It really is, until we realize the magnitude and the destructive nature of sin, the impact it has on the heart of God and on us and and on others. But because of the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus, we're set free from the Mosaic law, and we now live under grace by faith. You know, the Apostle Paul uses this uh, crude example of marriage that, that, you know, if our spouse dies, we're no longer bound by the law of marriage. We're, we're free to remarry if we want. You see, we, we died with Jesus. And we were raised to new life in Christ. We no longer are bound by our old nature. We're no longer bound by the law. We have been set free from sin and death. You know, we're all familiar with the Decalogue, the, the Ten Commandments. I'm convinced if you, you fail the first one, The other nine are easy to to fail. You shall have no other gods before me. We have a lot of other gods we often put before the one true holy God. You know, in Judaism, there were an additional 613 commands. Try to keep that perfectly. It's impossible. We can't even keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. The Apostle Paul argues that it's the law that brings to light the power of sin and the temptation to sin. Like I said, it's like being told you, you can't have that cookie or, or don't touch the hot stove. Or, don't do this and don't do that. I often wondered, you know, as a pastor, I, I pray for the congregation. I pray for people that aren't here. And I reach out to them and let them know that they're loved and they're missed. And I often wonder, are they further rebellious after that? See, Satan doesn't want us to worship God. He doesn't want us to come together in community. He doesn't want us to pray. He doesn't want us to read the word. Satan believes in God. He never obeyed God. So we need to know who our enemy is. There are a lot of people that don't believe in God, but there are people that do believe they just don't obey. There's something inside of us that just wants to do our own thing, be in charge. We want to be on the throne. We want to create God in our own image. The Apostle Paul uses that illustration of covetousness. Can you guys say that for me? Covetousness, God bless you. I, I don't know what it is about that word. <laughs> I just struggle over it. But he's using this to illustrate how the law brings light to our sinful desires. Do we covet? We don't have problems with that, do we? Look at the landscaping at my neighbor's house. It just looks so really good. I I really would like to have that. Peter in his first epistle says this. 
He said, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. Before coming to Christ Jesus, we did not realize the power and temptation and control of sin in our lives. Our sinful passions were aroused by the law of God. I've always said the law is good and holy and pleasing and perfect, but boy, it shows us how sinful we are, doesn't it? Paul says in Galatians 2, 19 to 21, he says, for when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all of its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, there was no need for Christ to die. You know, I, as I prepared for this, I, I read this uh, passage over and over in different translations. And, and I realize just how powerful sin is. And I, I think back to Adam and Eve had everything they could ever want. You could enjoy all of creation. You can eat whatever you want. You have harmony with, with God. Just one thing, the cookie jar. Do not eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for if you do, you'll die. What does Satan say to Eve? Did, did God really say you would die? Doubt and deception. No, your eyes will be opened. You'll be as wise, as smart as God. But their eyes were opened to the magnitude of their sin. See, that's a great place to start. You know, deceived by Satan, they threw it all away. To have what they wanted when they wanted it. You could have everything else you ever wanted, but just this one thing. We have so much in the world today. You ever try to find a channel on TV for something you want to watch? It's confusing. It's difficult. There are times I just give up. You know, it was simpler when you had three channels and rabbit ears, and they all went off the air at midnight, and they played the national anthem. You know, you had your pick. You know, Leave it to Beaver, I Love Lucy, you know, The Price is Right, whatever the case may be. But life was simpler. But now we have all these choices, and so many are not good. So many are not pleasing to God and they're not good for the edification and nurturing of followers of Christ. You know, too often we choose the wrong thing over the good thing that God has for us. And keeping rules are not going to bring about the life that is ours in Christ Jesus, but don't misunderstand what I'm saying. <laughs> I think God's moral standard is good and right and pleasing and holy, and we should strive to be more like Jesus, harmony with him and with one another. He wanted us to be free from the sin that so easily destroys our lives. We were talking about it in Sunday school. I, I think back to things I did as a kid that I, I still have remorse for. I'm still sorrowful over. I still regret. And I, I know I'm forgiven. And I know I don't have to ask for forgiveness again. That God's forgiven me. But see, that is the magnitude of sin in our lives. It destroys the good that God wants for us. So we have these passions, we have these desires. We're either bearing good fruit or bad fruit. We need to know who the enemy is. See, we will bear fruit in keeping with the one that we serve. Pastor Jerry was saying this morning, you have a black dog and a white dog. Which one's going to win? What's the one you feed? That's the one that's going to win. The one you seek and serve is the one that will be your master. In Christ, we're not sinless, but understand that we can say no to sin 
And the closer we walk with the Lord, the less that we'll be controlled by sin. What kind of fruit is being born in your life right now? Is it that which is good and pleasing and right? You know, I, I've been focusing on this for, for a few weeks now and just kind of praying and understanding the impact that we have every day on the lives of people around us. It can be as simple as a smile or a kind word. It can be to help someone in need that we're able to help. You know, loving our neighbor as ourself. When's the last time we loved our neighbor? <laughs> what have we done? We get so caught up in self and desire to, the desire to be in charge. But we're free to serve God with our lives that will bear fruit in keeping with the Holy Spirit of God. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says this in chapter 15. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. It's kind of like cutting a branch off of an apple tree and waiting for it to produce apples. It's just not going to happen. It's going to die. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. I am the vine, you are the branches. Branches that are caught off from the vine are not going to produce good fruit. If we're disconnected from Christ Jesus, we are not going to bear good fruit for God. There are many people who believe in God, but not everyone who believes in God obeys God. Is it your desire to obey God? It's mine. And I know that it takes work and it takes effort and it takes confession and repentance and a willingness to admit that we've harmed God and harmed ourselves and harmed others. But I refuse to let go. I know this world has nothing for me outside of the will of God. And people are celebrating everything but the one they should be celebrating. Too many that profess Jesus as Lord and Savior believe in God, but they're not obeying Him. You know, we can pray, we can ask God to help us stay the course, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, that we might live lives that bear good fruit for his kingdom. As followers of Christ Jesus, are we filled with the fruit of the Spirit? Do we have those Christ-like qualities and attributes that make a powerful difference? You know, in the, the past several weeks that we've been in Romans, I've been talking about our position in Christ Jesus versus our practice. You know, is our practice consistent with being a follower of Jesus as Lord and Savior? You know, are we seeking to bear good fruit for the kingdom? Are we still imbibing in the things of the world that really are, are going to be nothing? And we often stumble by living the old life and following people who are living a life apart from Christ instead of living the new life that is ours in Christ Jesus. You know, because everybody else is doing something, I hear my mom's voice, <laughs> it doesn't make it right. And there are an awful lot of people in the world today that profess to be believers of God. They just are serving the wrong God. They're held captive by the world and the things of the world. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus understood the, the magnitude of sin, but the willing of laying down self to serve God and to follow Christ. Jesus told the disciples, because I've been persecuted, you will be persecuted as well. What has God freed you from so that you can do the things he's freed you to do? And I'm not going to go into a whole laundry list of my own life, but I have regrets. 
sins that I've committed in the past that uh, I grieve over today. But I also realize the things that I've been delivered from in my life. That God has given me the ability to say no. The things that bring bad fruit. And say yes to the good things that God has for those who follow Christ. Paul says in Galatians 5, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. He goes on in Colossians to say, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, and passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. See, the law of God is good and holy and just and perfect. It doesn't bring about sin, but it does demonstrate the power of sin in our lives. Let me go back to my original thought about the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You know, as long as we have other gods before us, we're going to make things in images that we'll worship that are contrary to God. We are going to misuse the name of God. We're going to forsake the Sabbath. We are going to forsake honoring our mother and father. We might not physically commit murder, but how often do we think things in our minds we shouldn't be thinking? We might not be physically committing adultery, but Jesus says even thinking it in your heart shall not steal you, shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You know, when we go south on the first commandment, when we have other gods that we worship, it's so easy to break the commands in every other area. This is why we need Christ. This is why we are lost and without hope, without a Savior. See, sin defines what the law is. As long as we look at other people, we have a false sense of being good or better than other people. You know, as long as we compare ourselves to others. You know, the law shows us the power and magnitude of sin in our lives and our desperate need for Christ Jesus. Phyllis and I were talking about this. Why is it so easy to see everybody else's sin? And why do we want to fix everybody else and, and neglect the work we need to do on ourselves? You know, I believe if we pray, God, show me the sin in my life. I believe as you read and study and apply Scripture, as you pray, His Holy Spirit is going to tell you very clearly the areas of your life you need to work on. Who am I to look down on other people when I've got my own work to do? course, unless we're reaching down to help them up. I want to close with this passage from uh, Paul's uh, letter to the church in Galatia. It's Galatians 3, verses 21 to 25. And he says, is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin so we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. You know, the great thing about the law is it shows us our desperate need for Jesus as Lord and Savior. It points out glaringly how sinful we really are and how desperate we need a Savior. When we say yes to our sinful nature, understand we're saying no to God. All that is good and pleasing to Him. I, uh, I want to finish well. You know, it's, uh, 
too often feels like one foot forward and two backwards. And we get so consumed with the things of the world that we forsake the great blessing that is ours in Christ. She really are free to say no to sin. You really have a wonderful opportunity to walk with God and to have a close relationship with him. But it takes time and effort and diligence. But it is possible to walk closer, to sin less, and to strive to be more like Jesus each and every day. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you that you have not abandoned us to the grave or left us as orphans. Instead, you have given us everything that is ours in Christ as your children dearly loved. I pray for your congregation here and throughout the world that you may have more of our life this week. We might be intentional to seek you, to serve you, to love you and proclaim you. I, I pray, Father, that you would not give up on us. That you would not only forgive us for our sins, but give us a desire to, to truly repent and turn away and to grieve over sin that harms your heart, has hurt us and hurt so many others. Father, help us to be the church today in a, a world that is getting further and further away from you. I thank you, Father, for the faithful, the remnant, those that continue to gather, to continue to trust you, to continue to strive to be all that they can be in Christ. Give us the power to overcome the sin in our lives that we might be set free to do the very things you call us to do. For these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As I said earlier, we will celebrate communion today as a, a family of faith. We will wait until everybody receives the, the bread. And then we'll take the bread together as one body. And likewise, with the cup, we'll do the same thing. The only thing we ask is that you have received Jesus as Lord and Savior, that you have acknowledged that you are a sinner in need of his grace, that you have surrendered to his will in your life, and we're free to come together today. These visual reminders, today is Worldwide Communion Sunday. We think about we are celebrating with believers all over the world. From one body, from one loaf, from one cup, Jesus took the bread and he, he broke it. He gave thanks to God as he gave it to his disciples, likewise with the cup. And so we come together on this Worldwide Sunday, acknowledging that we are a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. Individually, we can do some things, but together, we can do so many things for the glory and honor of God. Amen. Let's pray. With joy, we praise you, gracious God, for you created heaven and earth. You made us in your image, and you kept covenant with us even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who by his life, death, and resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. Amen and amen. Lord, our God, send your Holy Spirit so that this bread and cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we with all the saints be united with Christ and remain faithful in hope and in love. Gather the whole church, O Lord, the glory of your kingdom. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you return again in glory. Lord, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Savior of the world. We give thanks to God the Father that our Savior Jesus Christ, before he suffered, gave this memorial of his sacrifice until he returns again. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 to 29, spoke about taking communion in an unworthy manner. He said, so then, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. 
said everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Let's take a moment to silently pray for God to forgive us of our sin, to remind us of our need for forgiveness, to restore us body, mind, and spirit. Gracious Father, we come to this table trusting in your great mercies. May we receive this sacrament with devout, believing, and grateful hearts as we receive the bread and the cup in memory of his passion. May his death be ever before us, quickening us to a holy resolve to hate sin, to love Christ, and to serve you through him. I invite the ushers to come forward. Hear the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he returns one day. This wafer for us is a visible reminder. Our Savior's body was broken in agony. He died a cruel death on the cross at Calvary, even praying for us, the depth of his love that we might know the power of God in our lives. Eat with thanksgiving and gratitude.
cup of juice reminds us that our Savior's blood was shed, even in his dying moments, in agony, prayed, he loved, and he realized that the power of Satan was broken in the world. This is a memorial we look back, but we also look forward and celebrate the day that we gather in eternity and we take the bread and the cup and we see our Savior face to face. Drink with thanksgiving in your heart. Jim, would you like to come forward and give me a hand covering the communion table up? Thank you. you know, too often, I, I think we overlook the magnitude of what we're doing here and what it means for us in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out in the power of your Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn today is uh, hymn number 434, Revive Us Again, 434 in your red hymnal. Heart with thy love. 
made so be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Hey Amen. I love it. You can hit those high notes. <laughs> you really do a great job. It's been a blessing worshiping with you today. I look forward to all that God has in store for us this week. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. You may go in peace.